Okay, we're live. Uh, I, I still don't have that option for speaker view, or I just have speaker view and gallery view. It's odd. And for me, I just have the three dots in my image, pin spotlight for everyone to hide self view. So that's odd. I could try giving you host and see if it shows up. Do you want to do that? Yeah. All righty. Okay, you should have host. All right, so attendees are filling in here. And uh, I think we'll pretty much get started. <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the first student lecture session. Uh, we're going to have three sessions today of student lectures. So <clears throat> today in this session, we are excited to have Aliyah present about human factors in freight transportation. Ibru is going to be discussing human robot interaction, cognition, and user experience. Yovella's presentation is in cognitive engineering. HS is in healthcare and Chen's is in ergonomics and physiological measurement. Uh, so this is a nice spectrum they'll be covering for us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. After each presentation, we'll have an opportunity for a few minutes of question and answer before moving on to the next presentation. Please take advantage of this opportunity as the presenters get a lot of questions and enjoy the opportunity to clarify their work or talk a little extra about what they're doing. Uh, please submit your questions in the question and answer box, and we'll do our best to make sure everyone gets a turn to ask their question. If there isn't time for yours, please use the networking directory to reach out to the presenter directly. Our presenters here are live, but if we run into issues, uh, we can switch over to a pre-recorded presentation that they have provided as backup. So if that happens, please bear with us. Aliyah, are you ready? Sure, I am. Okay, if you are, you may uh, share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Yeah. Okay, can everyone see my presentation now? Looks good for okay. my end. Perfect. Hi everyone, I'm Alia. I'm a second year PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I'm pleasured to be presenting to you my uh, PhD research topic today, which revolves around making interactions between trucks and vulnerable road users safer. Um, I'll jump right to some facts that motivated me to conduct this research specifically. Uh, so, um, just some facts with numbers. Uh, it's known that about 1.2 million pedestrians die and 50 million other, others get injured on a yearly basis just in road collisions. And uh, in a more, uh, on a more local scale in the city of Toronto, 69% uh, of fatal collisions from 2006 to 2019 involved at least one vulnerable road user. So vulnerable, vulnerable road users are uh, pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists, and uh, all road, use, road users basically who are um, less protected. And according to this statistics or this graph from the Ministry of Transportation in Ontario, um, it's, it's evident that although the road fatalities tend to decrease over the time, the proportion of pedestrian fatalities uh, keeps on increasing. So that is a very alarming uh, fact. And in terms of truck crashes specifically, uh, these are found to be uh, much more severe than other vehicle crashes, especially when pedestrians are involved. So one study shows that uh, pedestrians are two to four times more likely to be severely injured or die in truck collisions. Um, so after our extensive research uh, literature uh, in literature, we came to the conclusion that the strongest predictor for truck crashes is um, driver error, and that can be caused by either recognition errors, decision errors, or distractions. So we decided to focus our attention specifically on a specific uh, skill in truck drivers, which is 
hazard anticipation skill. So basically hazard anticipation consists of four main uh, steps. First, it's the awareness of traffic risks and the threats to safety. Second, it's uh, the, the visual search in order to detect the, the elements that might contribute to unsafe situations on the road. Third, it's to predict or to expect that latent hazards might uh, happen. And fourth, of course, is to respond in a timely manner uh, to avoid such conflicts. So this figure to the, to the left of this slide shows that uh, it requires a good hazard anticipation skill to, to predict or to, um, yeah, to realize that some humans might be crossing the road in front of this um, white truck to the right. So, so it's, it's difficult to, to predict that. So since hazard anticipation is a skill, so we decided to, to look into uh, how this skill is being um, trained in, uh, in truck driver training standards. So we came to the, to, to the fact that uh, according to truck drivers who were surveyed in a study, they mentioned that the current Canadian truck driver training standards are inadequate because they do not prepare drivers to drive in certain uh, settings such as a mountainous or slippery roads. So these surveyed uh, truck drivers recommended that more behind the wheel training should be included in, the, in these truck driver uh, training standards. Uh, in another study, uh, drivers had very positive opinions about simulator-based training, so, but they suggested two things. First, that uh, this simulator-based training should be better implemented uh, and taken as a serious training tool. And second, uh, that the driving environment should be made more realistic. So based on all these facts that I just mentioned, uh, I came up with my research plan so my big aim is to inform the development of uh, a specific hazard anticipation training and testing procedure uh, in order to enhance the safety of truck vulnerable road user interactions. And for, for that, I'll be using two very interesting pieces of equipment. Uh, first, a truck simulator. So the University of Toronto is currently in the procurement process of um, this simulator. It's a quarter cab heavy truck minisim uh, that's developed by the University of Iowa NADS. And uh, this um, simulator specifically is known for its high reality and validity. Uh, the second piece of equipment I'll be using are the eye tracking glasses that will be worn by participants who drive in the driving simulator just to examine whether these uh, participants perform the necessary checks and to identify uh, the gaps or the, the, the lacks in their skills. Uh, it, it also, this, these eye tracking glasses will also uh, measure the effect of in-vehicle distractions on truck drivers' latent hazard anticipation skills. Uh, my research plan uh, summary is as follows. So uh, it consists of six main uh, steps. First, I'll be conducting uh, some online interviews uh, at, for just to talk with truck drivers and uh, truck safety experts about the most hazardous um, driving situations involving vulnerable road users. And based on that, I'll be creating simulator scenarios out of these uh, hazardous situations between trucks and vulnerable road users. Then uh, we'll be recruiting some um, truck driver trainees to test their driver, driving uh, skills. Uh, after analysis of, of their results of, of the simulator drives, uh, a training and testing module will be hopefully created and hopefully also uh, validated and uh, put into practice. Uh, I'm about to wrap up my presentation today. So um, the key takeaways I just talked about are that truck crashes with vulnerable road users specifically are a serious uh, problem and road safety concern. Um, it was also found that driver recognition and decision errors and distractions are the main reasons for such crashes and that driver, uh, truck driver training standards in Canada are inadequate. So based on these three main facts, um, my research here uh, aims at improving hazard anticipation skills of truck drivers by proposing a hazard anticipation training and testing procedures. And to realize that and to make it more valid and reliable, I'll be using a truck simulator and eye tracking equipment. 
Um, thanks, thanks for li listening. Here are my references, and please don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Aliyah. D Dan, do we have any, any questions in the Q&A right now? Uh, we do not have any questions in, but if there's anyone out there that would like to submit one. Yeah, we'll we give a second answer. in case someone's typing. Uh, if not, please feel free to follow up with Aliyah uh, via the networking directory. But uh, we're going to give it just a second here. Aliyah, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I have a question? So. No, still no questions. Okay, cool. All right. Just a quick question for Elia. Thank you so much for presenting. So uh, my question is that, do you have the age limitation when you're recruiting the participant for the interview? Uh, I do not have an age limitation because um, truck drivers who, who begin their training uh, are of very different ages, like uh, people who still who are in the in their start of their career might uh, choose to be truck drivers, while people pe others who, who finish their first career decide to later to to start their career as uh, truck drivers. So no. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for your question, Chan. Okay. Well. If there are no other questions, uh, again, thank you very much, Aliyah. And next up, we have Abru. Are you are you ready, Abru? Uh, yes, I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. Well, you have the floor. And you can share your screen and uh, proceed with your presentation. Perfect. Can you see my screen? All clear. Mm, okay. Uh, um, beginning. Uh, hello, welcome to my presentation uh, on uh, the study about implementation of personality to robotic vacuum cleaners uh, using the Laban framework uh, via uh, expressive robot motions. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I uh, completed my bachelor's degree in, in industrial engineering from Bikant University and after graduation I have two years of uh, industry experience where I worked as a business analyst and now uh, I am uh, pursuing my master's degree here at University of Waterloo. And uh, a little bit introduction to the research uh, that I'm conducting. Uh, uh, Robotic vacuum cleaners are extensively adopted and used uh, currently, uh, and the, it's a very critical issue to study the perception of robot behavior and personality because uh, they are ro domestic service robots and they are in close proximity with, uh, with humans all the time in their everyday life. And the Laban framework uh, is uh, developed for expressive robot motion design, uh, which holds a great potential uh, in robotic motion uh, design. And we are, uh, I am actually uh, in, uh, aiming to improve human robot interaction in my master's thesis. And let's start with the literature review. Uh, first of all, Laban movement analysis frame is a framework developed by Rudolf Laban, who was a choreography and dance theorist. And he studied uh, human movement in a human movement in this framework. And this uh, framework is extensively used in psychology and computer science, as well as robot robotists. And it's a method, method to analyze and interpret meaning in how people move. Uh, it consists of four main categories of movement, uh, including shape, body, space, and effort. Uh, and the effort uh, category is classified in four elements containing uh, space, weight, time, and flow. And on the right, uh, you can see the Laban effort graph that's showing the four different uh, dimensions of effort. And this image shows the, the whole uh, Laban moment analysis framework uh, for uh, components of it. Uh, in this research, we'll be focusing on effort and shape uh, as, um, as highlighted here in this graph. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, some uh, research on robot personality. Uh, the first example is, uh, is concerned about uh, the ideal personality preferred by humans. It, it, uh, it, it tries to determine whether there is an ideal personality for those robotic vacuum cleaners. And uh, they, they tested if, if those motions can be distinguished. Uh, and the results show a significant effect of motion on the perception of robots' personality. And uh, on the graphs, you can see, uh, you can see the uh, implementation of Laban movement and this on uh, robotic motions. And in the, in the second example, uh, the researchers uh, selected three personnel from the seven dwarfs, including happy, sleepy, and grumpy. And they, uh, they tested if the time and space elements from the Laban movement analysis would be distinguishable in robot motions. And they also used a variable named interesting people, which determines uh, whether the robot seeks people or avoids people. And the results show, uh, show that motion behavior is successfully convey the intended personality in the robots. And uh, in, this, in the third uh, research, uh, the, uh, the authors uh, use uh, robots with two robots with a low degrees of freedom, including now and keep on. And they, uh, they tested two main behaviors in the robots, including simple dance and look for someone uh, tests. And they only manipulated the head motions of the robots. Uh, they, they, this, this research is significant because they developed the feature vectors for, for the implementation of Laban efforts in a systematic way. And they uh, included uh, several features, including velocity, uh, jerk, or orientation of the robot's head. And the results show statistically significant legibility of effort components in the robots. And they uh, claim that uh, even the simple robots can convey complex expressive states via motion. And here in this table, you can see the lab and effort features that were suggested by, uh, by the third research that, we talk, that I talked about. Uh, you can see they have features like range of motion, uh, target position, body position, and acceleration. So uh, based on the literature review that I conducted, uh, I came up with two main research questions. The major research question that's, uh, that I'm trying to address here in this research is, can a desired personality be uh, allocated to robotic vacuum cleaners based on the framework of Laban moment analysis to enhance the legibility of robots' inner states and intentions? The first question is, how can the five-factor model of personality be applied to robotic vacuum cleaners? And is there a preferred set of personality traits for, for those cleaners among users? And what is the impact of effort and shape categories from the Laban movement analysis framework on how uh, humans perceive robotic vacuum cleaners? Uh, so let's talk about the study design. And the, the, the first uh, step that I'm going to tackle is uh, conduct a questionnaire based on the big five inventory. Uh, the, I'll use the short version of the qu uh, questionnaire to determine uh, people's perception of robots behavior. And the second step is mapping of those personality characteristics to robotic motions using the framework of Laban moment analysis and the Laban effort features. And third step is the actual implementation of those robotic characteristics or robotic motions to the, uh, to the uh, vacuum cleaner. I'll be using iRobots uh, create two programmable robot and I'll use their development platform as well as the ROS uh, coding language. And the last step will be the test survey. Uh, I'll, I, I'm planning to use Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific. Um, and this uh, survey will focus on how uh, people can, how well people can distinguish the robot's inner states or, or intentions, task intentions. And here in this uh, graph, you can see the Laban effort framework uh, implemented to, to the robotic vacuum cleaner. And the, there are two components that I'm going to focus on, effort and shape, as I said. And uh, the sub, for each subcomponent, there will be two binary elements, two elements, two polar, polars. And, 
for example, for weight subcomponent, we will have strong or light uh, element. And this will be implemented, uh, reflected on the robot's motion as suction power. So the suction power of the robot can be high or low, and it will uh, eventually impact uh, the noises uh, the robot makes. Uh, for instance, in terms of time subcomponent, uh, the robot can perform quick or sustained motions, and this will be reflected to the robot motions as uh, speed. Uh, so they, they can be fast, they can move fast or slow. And yeah, uh, this uh, framework will be used to uh, used to determine how people's perception of the robots' uh, personality can change based on based on using a systematic uh, framework of robotic motion design. Uh, this is uh, this is a research proposal. Actually, I'm uh, at the stage of uh, coming up with my uh, you know starting my research proposal and having the having the approval from the committee. But yeah, uh, I wanted to give my presentation. Uh, and these are my references. Thank you for taking your time. And I'm, op and I'm open to all the questions from you. Thank you very much, Abril. Thank you. Uh, Dan, do we have any questions in the Q&A? Uh, none submitted right now, but we'll give them a few minutes or a minute or two and see. OK, yeah. I do have a, a quick question, actually. So. I think that's really interesting that you're using the Laban stuff in this context. I, I, I've only ever seen that in uh, like modern dance contexts, which I actually I, I, I recognize that um, because my girlfriend used to be a dance major. And I remember oh, really? her talking about uh, Laban. There was a whole class on Laban. So, so it, it, act, it works perfectly. And I'm I interested, um, is this something you had seen in terms of having precedence in literature for, for this type of thing? Or is uh, this something that you are sort of leveraging in an unusual way? I mean, well, uh, you kind of are regardless, but. Uh, well, I wish it was my idea to, to apply it to robotics, but no, uh, it's widely used in computer science and, and uh, robot motion design, uh, but it's mostly used in uh, in designing uh, motions for humanoid robots, like anthropomorphic robots uh, that have legs or arms that can perform gestures. But uh, this is the, I think this is the first, or like, you know, uh, the, the, the original uh, thing that, about this research is that it's applied to a non-anthropomorphic service robot. That's what, that's kind of what I was getting at. I think that's a very interesting, niche of the work so thank you yeah oh it looks like we have a, a question uh from john yeah john exactly asked what i want to ask so oh <laughs> yeah so uh, uh so for for those who can't see uh, john asked what type of personality traits do you predict users would attribute to robots well um we will use the big five inventory uh to, to to, to you know, collect people's opinions about robots' personality. In that uh, inventory, there are there are uh, several adjectives to describe the the personality of a robot or a, or a person. I I personally anticipate that robots will will think that the service robot like iRobot iRobot Roomba will have a personality like. Uh, punctual uh, organized and you know uh, clean and uh, serious like a serious personality so I, I anticipate people uh, perceive the iRobot cleaners more like an organized and serious person rather than a friendly and you know warm warm personality yeah really down to business <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he, he has a, a follow-up uh, task-oriented? Yes, exactly. Okay. Because, okay. because people perceive it only as a cleaning tool rather than an intelligent robot. Cool. Well, it looks like, looks like he sent you an interesting resource there. Thank uh, it you. Is, yeah, thank you very much for answering your questions and for your presentation. Uh, we're going to move on now to Yovella. Yeah. Yovella, are you ready? Yes. Um, OK, start. wonderful. Well, you have the floor. OK, 
Okay, so I hope I'm in the presenter slideshow mode. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, Great. looks good. Great. So hi everyone, I'm Yavala Marcelo and I'm currently doing my master's in systems design engineering at the University of Waterloo. Um, these are some of my research interests. I'm coming from a background in psychology, but I'm really just um, mostly interested in transportation, um, technology, and healthcare. So those are just some of it. Like I just enjoy everything that comes under human factors and ergonomics. And so today I'm gonna to give you a short overview of my thesis that is examining the age differences in the situation awareness and takeover performance in a semi-autonomous vehicle simulator. So research shows that there's a high crash risk amongst young and elderly drivers in comparison to other age groups of drivers. And young drivers have a tendency to adopt a risky driving style and behaviors that are associated with poor road safety, um, such as speeding, not maintaining adequate stopping distances. And they also have a higher rate of distracted driving than middle-aged drivers. And then on the other hand, we have senior adults aged 65 years and older who are driving more miles than previous generations, but they have some age-related declines in sensory, cognitive, and psychomotor abilities that might impair their driving performance and safety on the road. Um, older adults also experience more difficulties in driving situations that involve particular road geometries, such as turning on curved roads and intersections and higher levels of traffic density, like with, when you have the presence of vulnerable road users. Um, the age-related decline in mental functions also leads to a deterioration in their situation awareness which is necessary when you're doing high risk um, tasks or situations like driving. And older adults also need mobility to avoid the negative social and psychological effects of driving cessation and hence advanced driving assistance systems and uh, autonomous vehicles have been suggested to improve road safety and the mobility of older drivers. But since younger adults also have greater acceptance and positive perception of autonomous vehicles, a large proportion of this population might use semi-autonomous vehicles. So with semi-autonomous vehicles, drivers can engage in non-driving related tasks during vehicle automation, but they must be available to take over when the system reaches its limit. And the current research on semi-autonomous vehicles has examined the takeover performance of older adults while they are multitasking with varying levels of traffic, uh, oops, traffic density, um, weather conditions and levels of disengagement, but there's a difficulty of manually taking over control from automation that might vary in different situations and some situations may be more challenging than others. Um, takeover performance and situation awareness also can vary as a factor of age. So hence my study aims to examine the effect of different driving conditions such as road geometry and a scenario a particular road scenario, and I'll be looking at young, middle-aged and older drivers takeover performance on a straight versus a curved road on a highway and in an urban area while they engage in distracting tasks. So yeah, I know that sounds like quite a bit, but I'll go through the methods now to give you an idea of what, what exactly will be going on. So my participants will be between the ages of 18 to 24 as the young group, 35 to 55 as the middle age, and um, 65 and older as the old group. Um, so for the driving trials, the participants do not have to monitor the system or the road environment, but they will have to take over control of the vehicle when the system is incapable of autonomously driving, and it will send them basically a, a takeover warning signal. So they drive the simulator car into the road, um, engage autopilot, and perform a secondary non-driving related distracting task. So you have like the auditory end back task, um, surrogate reference task, and the critical tracking task in a distracted condition. Um, they perform, they will perform 12 driving situations. So six will be on that highway and six will be in an urban area. And um, within those six, I'll have different types of like non-distracting conditions and distracting conditions. And so in each session, the car will be driven for a few minutes. And after takeover, I'll ask them like two to three situation awareness questions and which they will answer. So for example, I'll ask them, did you see a bicyclist or a pedestrian trying to cross the road? And um, their situation awareness, reaction time and takeover quality will be measured. Um, situation awareness will be assessed using staged scores after takeover and um, from the eye tracking data. 
And the reaction time and takeover quality will be obtained from the data saved by the simulator software directly. So here's a short excerpt from my sample driving trial. So yeah, I'm gonna get that playing. Um, so the participant engages in the autopilot and after a while, the takeover request is triggered, yeah, before a hazardous situation occurs. So in this case, it would be like the bicyclist crossing the road. So if you can see at the end, yeah, there's a little bicyclist. I kind of was playing out on the speed of about to increase it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so that's an example. All right. So um, the outcomes of this research will aid car manufacturing companies that are developing semi-autonomous cars, that's level three, with appropriately designing that lead time of the takeover request to meet the driving styles of younger drivers and the abilities of older drivers. So if you notice like um, different groups require different times or different lead times to take over. Um, it will also help to improve road safety by reducing the accident rate of younger drivers. And furthermore, since seniors are one of the largest age cohorts in Canada and in other developed countries, improvements in semi-autonomous cars will provide older adults transportation to access healthcare and independent mobility, thus avoiding the social and psychological consequences of driving cessation that contribute to a variety of health problems like social isolation, lack of independence, and increase in depressive symptoms. And lastly, it is hoped that increases in the safety of semi-autonomous vehicles will improve older adults' perception and increase their trust and reliance on self-driving cars. So we can get hopefully more users um, using this new mode of transportation. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Yovella. Uh, uh, no questions in the uh, no questions in the Q and A yet. Okay. Do any panelists have any questions or? Oh, I see Chen Chen raising a hand there. Sorry for like being too curious. Okay, so no such thing as being too curious, Chen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you for your presentation. And um, I do have a question really related to your non-driving test. Like mm -hmm. uh, what non-driving test are you are taking in your experiment? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of ones that are usually recommended by the NHTSA, the NH NHT, I'd say that's the National Highway Transportation um, Association that does research um, with like driving in general. And some of the ones that they recommended, I have them here are uh, the auditory end back task. So um, that's kind of like when you recite a couple of numbers and um, you have your um, participant try to re um, repeat those numbers back again. So that's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a distracted task that's similar to like talking to someone, having a conversation with someone while you're driving. And then the other one I'll be using is <clears throat> the surrogate reference task. So that's like when you, I don't know if you might've seen it, like you have different side circles and you need to find one of them that's a different size. So that's kind of like a perception, visual perception task. Um, it's, it's again, like being having visual distractions in your surroundings. <clears throat> and the other one that I'll be using is the critical tracking task, which is kind of like um, you have a line in the center of your screen and they'll need to like um, make sure that line doesn't fall either way. So that would be similar to like having a radio, like tuning your radio where you need to get that precision movement in there. And um, yeah, it's kind of like a visual manual task that um, kind of similar to what you would be doing in a car. But then I'm using these kind of these standardized tasks so that I have <clears throat> that standardization in my results um, rather than using a more realistic um, task, you know, just to avoid that variability and distraction. Thank you. I just want to let you know I'm really bad at two back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm trying it out myself, but yeah, I'd like to see how that goes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we do have one question from the Q and A from Maya, who I'm going to unmute uh, right now. Maya, you there? Jenny, do you open up the Q and A? Dan, I think it's Mary. Oh. Mary? Uh, yeah. I have one yeah. from Maya Luster. 
So oh, we okay. have two questions. We have one from Maya and one from Mary. Mary, Maya's is first. Okay. Oh, you hear me now? Yeah, I think we only have time for uh, one of them, but uh, uh -huh. feel free to follow up after this yeah, one. Yeah, so I can see the question is, how did you choose the 12 trials and did you use a power calculation at the side? So the 12 trials are basically, um, so because I have to do different calculations, I'm looking at takeover performance on a highway as well as on an urban area. So six of them are gonna be on the highway and six are gonna be in an urban area. But then I also have different types of distractions. So um, some of them are not gonna have, um, they're not gonna be driving. So one in one situation, basically there will be a manual task. So basically they drive the, the car for the whole length of the journey. Um, and then the other five are the different types of distractions that I have in there. And um, I'm also looking at straight versus curved road. So from there, Three will be on a straight and three will be on a curved road. Like they'll be taking on a straight versus a curved road. So that's kind of like how I get my um, my 12 trials in there. Yeah, and um, I did not use a power calculation to decide. So I, I used a power calculation only for my sample size. But um, yeah, so that's basically how I got my 12 trials. Um, I don't know if there's a- Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Yovella. Uh, we are going to move on now to H. Sure. And uh, H, are you ready? If so, you have the floor. One second. I'm trying to share my screen with you. Okay. I hope you can see the presenter view now. Great. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. Welcome, everyone, uh, to my presentation on exploring expertise development, interface design, and evaluation in neurocritical care. My name is uh, Ije Uratan. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Professor Catherine Burns' Advanced Interface Design Lab uh, at the University of Waterloo. So um, in our current situation of the pandemic and uh, actually a, a world of, um, you know, lots of different uh, dynamic information flowing around, it is actually very challenging to develop um, expertise in certain areas or complex socio-technical environments. Um, and what is often needed in, in these type of complex uh, environments is uh, to find some kind of support that helps understanding these complex relationships. And um, these type of, uh, you know, uh, supports can be uh, often described as external supports and interfaces are um, an example for that. So uh, current existing ones, they do not always fully match the needs of users. And uh, I'll be kind of talking about one of those specific areas where um, this is very important and that could really uh, help in the future. Um, there are multiple things here on, on this slide, but I want to talk about what we first understand of novices and experts and how that whole process is uh, basically developing. Um, so I think we, we first need a, a common understanding of what we call an, a novice. And uh, when I searched for, you know, dictionaries or, um, you know, other types of literature defining this term, it, it often said something related to a person who is new to or inexperienced in a certain task or situation. Um, in this specific case today, I'll be talking about fellows, uh, fellow physicians in critical care um, who are my, my novices. Um, if we look at the experts, however, they are often um, defined as a person who has extensive skill or knowledge in a particular field. And um, I will be referring to them as the seniors or senior physicians. Um, in, in healthcare. So um, there are so many multiple different ways of, uh, you know, how this, this process of expertise development is being described in literature. And um, there are many explanations, but I just wanted to pull together a couple of them that I found really relevant for the healthcare area. And uh, here are uh, some of them listed. Um, so when a novice um, in, in a new environment needs to kind of develop that expertise, they are um, kind of expected to learn a couple of things. So these are not only, uh, you know, related to the skill sets um, or, you know, um, seeing a specific amount of, of assessments or clinical cases and related issues, but also how to, you know, interpret these results um, and, and come up with an appropriate treatment plan. And uh, the whole decision-making process around that 
is really crucial and it's not as easy as um, you know just a list that we would kind of look at and and uh, go through. So they need to um, learn even how to prioritize their tasks and uh, when to uh, consult the other team members or other experts from different departments. And uh, in this context, situation awareness plays really a big role because um, often novices do not have um, really that, that level of uh, situation awareness that is required um, to really make those uh, appropriate decisions um, at, at, at the right time. Mm -hmm. So this is one example um, of how a, a, a critical care unit looks like. So the patient is kind of surrounded by all these um, different uh, devices and these rooms are, are just filled up with uh, lots of different equipment and all of them are displaying different types of uh, information, right, or, or data. And um, it can be quite overwhelming seeing that for the first time and, uh, you know, reading from all different devices and Kind of making your decision based on all these different inputs is uh, yeah really challenging so what i want to to show here is also that multimodal monitoring is required so we need kind of interfaces that merge all these different types of um, data onto one platform that is kind of easy to understand and intuitive um, but again also including aspects such as high cognitive workload you know how, how can we reduce that on interface or you know, um, enable high situation awareness and reduce the, the errors and, um, you know, make the, the clinicians be able to, to act fast or um, quickly to, um, you know, traumatic brain injury patients, for instance. Um, time is a really big factor here. And, um, you know, the, the teams need to work together. They all have different types of backgrounds and trainings. And um, what is one really important fact here is that they all need to gather their understanding from these different systems and kind of make a, a trend to the future. So they need trajectories. And, um, and this is one of the, the parts that is really interesting um, for me to find out. But first, when we start this project, um, we, we were asking ourselves, so how do novices in neurocritical care develop expertise? But also from, from the experts perspective, uh, so how do they transfer their expertise to novices? and also, what kind of challenges exist in um, expertise development within this specific area? And for later stages of the project, we want to find out whether the ecological interface design can be some kind of support um, for the development of expertise in neurocritical care. And if yes, how? So um, I'll be going back to, to 2019, uh, where I did some kind of, um, I had a little learning experience at Toronto Western Hospital. And um, I was shadowing different uh, clinicians, um, mostly physicians though, and nurses. And I was kind of watching their daily uh, work, but also how they were developing and transferring their expertise. Um, and that all, like all these insights um, helped me to kind of gather an understanding of what's going on there. So there are different types of ways how clinicians are transferring or developing expertise in these areas. And uh, here are a couple of examples. So um, for example, during ward rounds, so in the mornings they will meet with the team and uh, you know there are sometimes around 10 people gathering around the patient and they would discuss about um, you know, the, the, the specific case and what kind of updates are there. And um, they would have this discussion with the senior and all the others, um, the interdisciplinary teams. And um, so everyone has to learn and update each other, but this also helped, um, especially novices, to kind of get a certain um, order of steps or, you know, a, a routine and their actions. And this is very important. Um, so when they had to kind of, um, yeah, they, they were not all uh, on the same level. So, of course, they always have questions and, um, yeah, they, they might not be, you know, very um, open about asking the senior right away. So uh, there were some kind of student round session in the afternoons where they would gather with one uh, senior and they would talk about a specific new case that just came in and they would just discuss about this case. Um, there are of course different other ways of how they were learning um, and, and kind of building up that expertise. So they of course also had the opportunity to had a uh, first hands-on experience with the patient. So, um, um, the seniors were watching them uh, and only they would only interact or, or interfere in their actions um, if uh, that novice would do kind of, um, uh, uh, yeah, harm the patient 
so, um, but besides that, they were just, you know, it would be a trial and error kind of um, situation. Um, and yeah, they, they would also, like seniors would also give feedback, which is very important uh, for their learning process. But um, yeah, it's, it's up to the novice uh, whether they are really understanding that feedback as well. Um, with all these different kinds of, of, you know, developing expertise or uh, different ways, I, I tried to model that uh, with an approach called cognitive work analysis. And this uh, framework actually helps uh, to, to understand these complexities and in these areas. And um, it also kind of um, gathers uh, the, the like understanding the, the human perception or the cogn cognitive processes here. So um, later on, it's also possible to use this uh, framework to uh, design interfaces. And um, yeah, I, I did actually use only the first two um, steps of that CWA cognitive work analysis framework. Um, the first step is called work domain analysis. And um, this one kind of examines the, the overall environment and air, all the processes that are going on. And the control task analysis, the second step, um, portrays the, the specific tasks that, that lead to uh, um, specific goals. So with all these different types of insights, uh, we came up with, uh, you know, also using the ecological interface design um, approach that helps uh, users to, you know, um, come up with uh, an interface and uh, support the, the user with, um, you know, the like specific complex relationships and uh, show them in, in such a way that, you know, the user can become an adaptive problem solver and even encompass these abnormal situations um, or even reduce uh, human errors. This is one example of, of the work domain analysis. So this is an abstraction hierarchy. It's uh, very detailed, but overall we have five levels of abstraction. And uh, at the very top, uh, we have the general purpose of a specific system that we try to analyze. And then we go in more depth uh, down to physical form. So um, more detailed steps, basically uh, kind of combining all these different relationships from one to another element here. Um, I did pick three columns. So the nervous system cognition helped me to uh, kind of prepare for my um, observational study or uh, learning experience at Toronto Western. So I, I did look into, you know, like the physiological or biological uh, backgrounds um, of, of what's going on in neurocritical care. And um, then I tried to, to map all the two um, other columns to my um, findings or, or what I have observed there. So um, I was really interested in, in how they were monitoring treating patients, uh, but also what kind of challenges were they facing. And uh, yeah, I won't be talking about this in depth, but uh, please reach out to me if you're interested in, in this specific part. Um, the control task analysis was my second step. So here I tried to um, compare actually novices and experts um, actually or decision-making process. So um, I did pick a specific scenario, which is a high intracranial pressure. It's also called the tight brain um, scenario. And um, this is kind of a, an example for us to, to understand this kind of path. Um, so this uh, approach is, is a decision letter here in the middle. Uh, we usually start from the left bottom, the activation. Um, so just as an example, we would have high intracranial pressure shown on a monitor and we would kind of have an alarm maybe sounding here. And, uh, you know, a novice or expert would go through all of these steps, go up to the evaluation process and interpreting the, the different options and then go down to the execution of a specific task or kind of treatment of, of a patient. Um, but what we can see here, so that the red parts here would show the differences between the expert and the novice um, and, and more specifically. So novices often struggle with um, even reading or understanding the, the intracranial pressure waveforms or the numeric values. So they might be able to, you know, look into standard operating procedures or, or some kind of uh, ranges, you know, that they might find online or in books to understand the, the numeric values, uh, but how to interpret the waveform. So this requires a bit more um, understanding and in depth here. Um, and there are multiple more uh, problems that they might have um, when they have to, to treat that patient uh, that is suffering from high uh, tachycardia pressure. Um, and this gives us some kind of insight, right? Where we could uh, develop such support. Uh, so, with that being said, uh, for my first study, I'm, I'm 
planning to um, actually check for completeness of what I have um, observed and kind of add or, or correct a couple of more things here. Um, for that, I'm, I want to have uh, I want to conduct some semi-structured interviews with uh, seniors and fellows. So from seniors, I want to know what kind of mental models do they have and uh, how does, um, you know, I want to find out what are their insights uh, for, for expertise development, how do they even use the, the bedside monitoring data to uh, come up with their overall decision um, for that specific or for, for patients in general. Uh, from fellows, I want to understand what kind of gaps um, exist for them. So what have they not covered, uh, but what will they be expected to develop in the future when they um, are becoming an expert? And um, the one example of ICP that is, um, yeah, one possible situation that we could uh, analyze in more depth, but um, yeah, th there might be other interesting topics coming up, other relevant uh, topics uh, that they find, um, you know, really important to learn or, you know, uh, that, that would kind of look into the direction of expertise. So um, we want to, to find out up-to-date requirements uh, from both uh, on, on learning, for example, or analyzing these specific um, elements on interface. Um, with all that, uh, we actually hope to come up with uh, some design um, ideas, and uh, we want to test those ideas on um, in the second study. So as a preparation for that, we, we hope to, to test uh, that kind of specific support of the ecological interface for fellow physicians only. And uh, how we want to do that is basically by comparing two groups um, with each other. So we'll have one fellow group uh, using an existing interface, um, including, of course, the neurovariables and adult patients here. Um, and then we will have another group looking at um, the ecological interface that uh, we designed for them. And uh, yeah, by comparing that, actually here, uh, I want to briefly show one example of an existing interface. So this is pretty yeah, actually newer one, um, and it already has really great uh, um, elements here. So we can see that, that the system is very adaptable actually. So, uh, you know, clinicians, they can just um, customize their uh, variables. They can, um, they have a list at the right and uh, they can just, you know, click on them, drag them over to the left and then display them in the middle as uh, for a really wide uh, time span here. Um, and they can kind of zoom in and out and dig that, all makes it much easier for them to trend um, the whole situation of the patient. So this is probably the one that we will be using um, soon and we will kind of build on top of this um, where we think uh, we would need more additional uh, you know, design elements here. So for the second study, um, again, I would be uh, looking at different variables. So I am very much interested in situation awareness, um, the correctness of the steps, the order of the steps, um, how they're visually scanning actually those interfaces and also their reasoning strategies, right? Um, and overall, I'm expecting that uh, the um, experimental groups, so the ones that are using the, the um, ecological interface, they will perform higher than the other um, group that is just using the T3 interface. Um, yeah, I hope to contribute with this work to, to healthcare, of course, and different uh, clinicians or, you know, even um, information, health information managers and so on. Um, the other direction is, of course, engineering design. So uh, I hope that tech developers from different uh, industries uh, who are working with big data can learn some something from our studies. And um, also the, the more theoretical part of expertise development. So I hope to um, contribute to this area as well by, you know, Kind of observing whether people are uh, having better or higher you know learning curves um, among novices especially and even for experts uh, i hope that they can maybe see uh, ways of how they can incorporate uh, different um, teaching um, ways or visualizations into their uh, daily schedule and um, hopefully this could be integrated in already in the university so they can learn how to apply or, or use these interfaces much earlier yeah, overall, I, I hope to, um, you know, get, get insights from the observations, interviews, and uh, come up with a, a better design, um, which I call an ecological interface. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to 
you know, address and foster expertise development with this. Um, I will be looking at the short-term effects of novices' behavior, so it's not really a long study where I'm, you know, checking uh, every, uh, I don't know, couple of months uh, and, and see how they have uh, learned or applied this interface. Um, but yeah, I, I think there will be some interesting findings here. I would like to thank uh, everyone who's of uh, in this project. So of course, uh, my um, advisor, Professor Burns, who's guiding me through this project and uh, all the other um, students in our lab who have contributed to this work. Um, I'm really thankful for the, the clinical cooperation as well with the uh, UHN or Toronto Western Hospital and um, also the, the funding that is uh, you know, provided for this work um, by the CREATE program or uh, Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology at the University of Waterloo. Thank you very much all. Um, if you have questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much, AJ. Uh, we do have to move on to Chan's presentation right now. However, I encourage everyone to follow up with H A via uh, either the networking directory, preferably, uh, or if we have time at the very end of this session, which we probably won't, uh, we can maybe get back to some questions. But uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to follow follow up. Uh, real quick before we start, we do have one outstanding question for H A. Um, Oh, which I, we, we don't really have uh, time right now. Well, I was just, I was going to yeah. direct her that she could oh. use the uh, type answer. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. To answer that question directly in that while Chen is presenting. Yes, sure. very true. Chen, you, uh, you ready to go? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. You guys see my screen? Yep. You're okay. all set. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm happy to share my latest research on. Um, real-time physical workload assessment in manufacturing. Okay, so, so I'll go through the background methods, data processing results and major findings in this discussion part for this study. So first, why manufacturing? The nature of manufacturing actually involves in the physical demanding tasks such as picking and place, you know, lifting, and uh, also the physical workload always involved in the manufacturing, which means the efforts from the muscle to try, try to keep certain positions in order to meet the task performance. Well, the physical workload also exists in a high repetitive and low load tasks, such as assembling, which shows in the picture. So the accumulation of physical workload will affect the attention and uh, in the long term, that will lead to the physical that will lead to the work-related musculoskeletal disorders. So there's a necessity of the real-time physical workload assessment. Well, so far, you know, uh, the previous research have used many methods to assess the physical workload. Well, like uh, there's limitations for existing method that can be used in the real-time on-site manufacturing. So for example, EMG, which is, which you know, measure the muscle activity that can provide continuous data about the muscle activity, but actually it's highly sensitive to the environment such as electronics and um, magnet in the environment. And it also requires like a static posture that will provide the better data for the muscles, well, which is ob obviously not feasible in the manufacturing environment because um, you know, workers are always moving around. So, um, because of their, most of the methods are high sensitive to the environment and also it cannot uh, allow the, you know, uh, it, it will limit the workspace for in the manufacturing. So here's what I'm pump out, like the changes of facial features might be a way that to indicate the physical workload in the manufacturing. Well, First, it's easy to implement. You just set up a camera in, uh, in front of the worker's face. And then it can also provide the continuous physical workload related features. Well, because there's already like tons of um, previous studies have shows in the physical tests, such as grip exertions, arm car exercise, and, in, and incremental in intensity cycling tests that uh, there are increasing movement of eye, eyebrow, nose, mouth, jaw, head, and face, and even cheeks. So yeah, but like none of these studies have applied the changes of facial features in the manufacturing. So here is 
where my study will start from. Well, lack of researchers have applied the change of the visual features as a potential physical workload assessment, considering the limitations for existing physical workload assessment math methods. And also it hasn't been applied into the manufacturing scenarios. So here's my study purpose, is try to evaluate whether visual features changes will be a reliable and valid measurement for physical workload induced by the highly repetitive assembling test. Okay, so here's my research question. Are measure changes in facial features consistent for individuals performing the same task during separate sessions? And are measure changes in facial features correlated with rating of preserved exertion? And how do measure changes in facial features correlate with um, typical physiological measures of exertion? Okay, so here's my method. Um, Originally, I will require like 16 participants, but right now I finished only four participants for the pilot study. And all of them will finish like two sessions. Um, and the sampling test will be they screw the nut over a bowl like as fast and as many times as possible until exhaustion. Well, the measurement will include the EMG for the mass activity, heart rate and rating of their perceived exertion, their performance and their facial features through a GoPro camera in front of their face. Okay, so here's I'm go through the data processing. I will first output the 3D coordinates from 2D video by implement the convolutional experts constraint local model. And they this is the this is so far the best model because it's trained by like multiple data bases. And uh, it has a uh, it all performed the existing facial landmark detection algorithms by showing the smaller interocular distance error. Okay, so I also try to avoid the effects of head movement on the movement of the other landmarks. So by first I figure out the head movement and then I um, subscribe each move, uh, subscribe the movement of each landmark by the head movement. All right, uh, this is a facial feature that I choose which shows in the orange cross that uh, based on literature review, the official landmarks were selected related to eyebrow, eye, head movement, mouth, and the jar. Okay, and uh, in, you know, the heart rate will be different from different persons. So in so I normalize the heart rate by heart rate, a uh, percentage of heart rate reserve and the performance will be the number of finger movement. And the data window will select you know, every two minutes, the participant will report their how hard they feel. So I try to use the data a data window in the middle 40 seconds in order to avoid their effects when they're reporting the score. Okay, so here's the data analysis. First, I ran the PRT test on their RPE and percentage of heart rate, heart rate reserve and performance. And of course, the average movement of selected facial, facial landmarks and also ran the Pearson product moment correlation between the feature feature changes and the RPE percentage of heart rate reserve and test performance in order to answer my research question. Okay, so here's my result. This figure show the very first and last frame of each participant on each session for their 2D coordinates. But like, unfortunately, I didn't find like a major trend for the change of the feature features, probably due to the small sample size. And uh, uh, for the PRT test, you can see like the RPE significantly improved, as well as the finger movement and performance. And uh, the facial features related to the eyebrow head movement actually increased significant at the end of the test. There's also like the strong correlation between the facial features and RPE and the performance as well as the percentage of heart rate reserve. Okay, so, so here's my major finding. The head movement and left eyebrow probably be the potential indicator for the physical workload since they are highly, uh, they are like uh, have the huge improvement, uh, has a huge movement at the very end of the test. And also they have a high correlation uh, with the other physiological measures related to the physical workload. Right, uh, there's absolutely, there are shortcomings of what I have so far. I absolutely need to increase the uh, sample sizes and also to include more types of tests. Uh, 
for the data window selection, I need, I think in, not, in other than the 40 seconds in the middle, I probably choose the 10 seconds before they're reporting the uh, physical exertion because it's gonna be more representative for their physical status before they're reporting the exertion. All right, thank you uh, for sh let me sharing my recent study and this is my reference and I would love to take any question. Thank you very much, Jan. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, no questions currently in the chat or the Q and A. Anyone has them? Be happy to have them. Yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll give a minute for Chen. We have we have uh, five minutes till this session ends. Okay. Uh, so if if we don't get any questions for Chen right now, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could circle back to one of those other ones, yeah. Dan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess we should go back to the first one we didn't quite get to, which was from Maya. I know that was answered in the chat, but would, who was that for? I think you'll vote. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. So would you like to just kind of recap that for us, Yvela? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so Maya's question was um, regarding how situation awareness is affected by age in relation to semi-autonomous vehicles. So yeah, I think um, the thing with semi-autonomous vehicles is that, and even right, right now with Tesla, um, you have the expectation that when it's on automation, when it's self-driving, you can do like whatever you want to do, right? So that's how I'm looking at um, distracted driving. And I have those distracted tasks in there. Um, because there is the expectation that um, users or drivers will be doing other things while they're driving. But um, the thing is, these cars do give you a takeover signal. So like for whatever reason, when the, source, when the system or the software fails and it's unable to continue the journey, it sends um, a takeover signal similar, kind of similar to what, what I showed in the video there, but maybe obviously a bit more better than what I had. But um, yeah, and then at that time you're expected to take over. Um, yeah, but then while you're driving, you're, you're obviously going to have other things in the environment, like there might be another car, um, in some scenarios I have like, probably something like at an intersection in like the urban areas where you might have a car, um, cross in front or a pedestrian or a cyclist or, you know, something happening in your surrounding, which you need to, um, be aware of. And of course, while driving, you should always have awareness of your surroundings. Um, hence the importance of situation awareness. So the thing with older adults is that um, their reaction time might be slow while they're having that transition and they might need like more attention in comparison to younger and middle-aged drivers. So yeah, so there's that expectation that their situa situation awareness might be um, impacted during that transitional time from yeah automation to driving. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we got time for one more because I know there was Connors that we didn't have a chance to ask. Yeah, I think in, uh... that's a good, uh, good, quick one to wrap up on. Okay, so Connor had a question for Etch asking, how long was your observation period and what were the largest surprises to come from these observations? Uh, I know you already typed a response to this, but would you like to recap it for everybody? Sure, yeah, why not? Uh, it was around a, a two months period. Um, I was at Toronto Western um, Hospital. And um, yeah, it was like during different times, of course, um, usually in the mornings till, till afternoons or so, uh, like basically looking at one shift or, or one handover. Um, yeah, and, and the other part, what did I find challenging was kind of, uh, or interesting, um, there were lots of communication issues there, uh, which was really interesting because some people would just complain about the other clinicians and uh, it, it was just funny to to be in to to observe that um, but there were also a lot of um, you know things that that were unclear to them um, and especially regarding like technology or or you know learning from tech is uh, really something um, that I would have not expected that they wouldn't really be educated much about it um, you know because there are always new people coming in uh, like always like almost every couple of weeks or so, there would be someone new uh, in any of the teams and they would have to pick it up themselves, like how to use the equipment or um, the, the tech. And um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, a lot of these devices are staying in the units for a very long time uh, because, you know, they, they 
the, the managers, I guess, they don't want to shift to new um, equipment very quickly. Of course, that also takes a lot of training and so on. Uh, and people don't like those type of changes there. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I'm using like a, a newer interface to compare it with, but if I was to compare it to an older one that they're currently using, it would have been a version of, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe 2000 or 1990s something, uh, which is quite a big difference, right? Um, we're using a lot of more advanced technology these days, especially with like touch screens or, you know, zooming in and out and these type of um, extras. So yeah, that was really interesting for me to see. Great, thank you. Awesome. Um, All right, well, that concludes our our first student lecture. Uh, so thank you for everyone and our audience for questions. Uh, there's a lot of good, good stuff in that session. Uh, so we appreciate everyone's contribution. I do want to remind everybody that we're uh, playing bingo, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the day. So if you haven't started yet, please retrieve a bingo card from the website and join in and submit your card by 4.15 PM for a chance to win a free student membership to HFES. Also, please make a note of your impressions on these lectures as you'll want to vote for the audience favorite, most innovative, and most engaging lectures. Your ballot is on the voting page of the website. Uh, our next event is a coffee break with a drop-in as you please networking session hosted by Sue, which is open and ready for you to join. And you can find a link to join that and link to participate in the Padlet uh, in the sessions link page. It's also in the chat though, right here. Um, Megan just dropped that in there. So. Uh, People, you can move over there and everyone else who uh, is presenting next, uh, I'll meet you in the room. And uh, our next session begins at 1140. So thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, see you soon. <laughs>